Good morning. It is revising time and I am over an hour into this live stream this Wednesday morning and I started out just very flustered. <laughs> Part of it is that I'm still not, I'm so used to this live stream being at uh, 10 a.m. to noon for me, but now that I am in a different time zone, it's 8 to 10 and while I wake up there 6, 6.30 every day and that's fine, I just, I'm not used to like jumping in so fast. So it was a little bit of an adjustment, but here is what I have done. Uh, today is all about doing my agent revisions on my middle grade mystery novel. And so the first thing I did, of course, was to print the book out because I, even if it's not a super big revision, I just really, it helps me a lot to take it to paper and get my eyes off the screen and I kind of see the book in a different way. So I went ahead and printed the book out and I also printed out the editorial letter. And then this morning when the live stream started, I was like, well, I don't really have a plan. I'm just going to gather a bunch of tools <laughs> and put it all out on the desk and we'll see what happens. So I have all kinds of different post-it notes. I have colored pens and highlighters. And when the first sprint started, I just, I started by reading through the editorial letter and I'm honestly, I'm still on the second paragraph of a three page letter um, because that is the change that they suggested suggested in this one is by far the biggest note that I got. Everything else is gonna take a lot of line editing, which I'm going to save for last. So I'm gonna see if I can explain exactly what the issue is. So first of all, this novel is called The Warp and Woof and it's, okay, I'm just gonna read Maybe I'll just read the first part of the editorial letter and, and this will help. Uh, so all you need to know is it's a middle grade mystery. There are three POV characters, uh, Hazel, a girl, Felix, a boy, and Guff or MacGuffin, who is a bloodhound. And it alternates between their points of view. So, and also this is a 35,000 word draft, which is pretty short and um, that is relevant. So. That's what you need to know. So here we go. The first part of the editorial letter says, we're wondering if it might be possible to introduce the mystery a little earlier in the book. Once the theft happens and we realize the missing pets are the work of a serial pet napper, the narrative hits a perfect pace that is maintained until the very end. Pause. I just realized it would probably help if I shared the premise of this book. So the super short pitch for this is that a girl and her bloodhound move into an apartment building and when her landlord's uh, parrotlets are stolen and they realize there is a pet napper among them she starts a watch group for the kid kids and pets in the building okay so the theft of the parrotlets is is the catalyst that's like the moment where the mystery starts and I have to be honest this is something that even working in my Scrivener doc early on I knew was an issue and I did my best to like to address it, but it it's just it's a really big issue. So let me let, let me give you some like numbers to put this into perspective. In a let's see, this book is 174 pages or 35,000 words. If you have a 174 page book, the catalyst that moment should happen somewhere between 15 and 20 pages in. And right now it happens, I'm not joking, on page 50. It is way too far into the book. And the reason why is because I have these three POV characters. So Hazel gets the first chapter and there is a lot of setup. And that was the next note here. Um, at the moment, the first chapter also does a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to world building. So we found it hard to fully engage with the conflict because we were absorbing a lot of names and important details. If the parrotlets were to go missing a little bit earlier, Hazel might be able to learn about the residents of the building and the neighborhood more gradually as she begins to investigate the mystery. A totally valid note. The catalyst is just way too late. So right now the first chapter is way too long. It's Hazel and it's, yes, it's a lot of, there's some backstory for her. There's world building introducing the, the residents as she moves into this building and all kinds of stuff. And then I move to Guff or MacGuffin, the dog's point of view his opening chapter, which includes a little bit of his backstory. And then it moves back to Hazel and then Felix. And he has some backstory too, obviously. And then it's back to Hazel. So it's chapter five 
And that ends with Hazel discovering that the parrotlets have been stolen. Five chapters in, again, for a book this short, that is just, that's, that's not acceptable. <laughs> so what I realized this morning is that this is not, this particular note is not a revision, this is a rewrite. And that's not a scary thing. I will link my videos up here about rewriting versus revising and why you should not be afraid of rewriting and why rewriting is actually often faster and less intimidating than revising. Um, but that that's what I need to do. And the good news is, and it says this in my letter, that once it the story hits the point where the parrotlets are stolen, the pacing is perfect. And I, I think that's true. I felt that as I read the book. The Even in that the chapters get a little bit shorter and I'm moving quicker from Hazel to Felix to Guff and going through them. In the beginning, again, because you have to do all the setup, it just moves a bit slow. And again, we don't get to that catalyst until 50 pages in. Now, the reason I say I need to rewrite this instead of revise this is because if I were to just open this document and try to figure out, you can't just, as you can imagine, you can't just take a catalyst, in this case, the theft of these parrotlets, and shift it back 25 pages and it not have an enormous ripple effect on like everything. And I don't want to try to do that. That feels like, you know, trying to juggle water. It's just, I'm not going to be able to keep it together, you know? So I'm going to start, here's what I did. First of all, this was rather tedious, but I went ahead and I used these post-its and color coded them so that I could easily find each character's chapter. So Hazel is yellow, Felix is blue, and Guff is this kind of green. And uh, there's one pink one back here because there is one chapter from another character's POV. And uh, so I went ahead and did that. And then I just kind of started going through and writing on post-it notes so I can easily shift everything around, like rather than writing on the document itself. The notes specifically that my agents gave me and then also some ideas I had onto, vaguely speaking, how I might start to address this problem. So the first thing I wrote, for example, was the first chapter, Hazel's first chapter, needs to be split into two shorter chapters and I need to have her meet or at least see Felix sooner to kind of bring him into the story. And Felix is the character who draws the comics. I mentioned before that this book is like kind of told in a partial graphic novel kind of format and a lot of that comes from Felix. He loves drawing comics and as the mystery picks up he is drawing his theories or their theories as a group on how the parrotlets might have gotten stolen and who how a certain suspect might have gotten away with it or why they would have done it things like that. So I realized that one way I can really help move this catalyst up earlier in the book is to lean a little bit harder on the comics because they don't take up a lot of word count and I can show in a picture something that might take me like an entire page to say in the narrative if that makes sense. And I this is again why revising won't work here and I really want to like let go of the five chapters that I wrote and figure out a like a big picture way of completely restructuring them. So that's where I am right now. I've just gone through and again I'm still only on the second paragraph of the edit letter, but I'm really just focusing today on not actually making any edits, but just coming up with a kind of big picture plan for how I'm going to start to incorporate this. And I think what I'm going to do next is do a very general outline, like just bullet point style of what chapter one might look like now from Hazel's point of view if I stop it halfway through the existing chapter one and then bring in the dog's POV and Felix's point of view and POV and the comics and then experiment with what happens if the parrotlets are stolen much sooner in the story and what the following chapters might look like. I hope that makes sense. So that's what we're doing right now. continue to work on this for the rest of the live stream and I do not have it figured out yet. This is definitely, I think, 
once I actually figure out how I want to restructure basically the first five chapters, rewriting them is going to be very quick because I'm going to be using a lot of the same information. It's just that it's going to be in such a different order now that, uh, yeah, that's why the revising, I can't just like shift things around. I need to come up with the beats first. And I th there's just so many different ways I can do this. One of the things I liked about the beginning is that there was kind of a, a false start to a, a very low stakes mystery. Like the first thing Hazel learns when she moves in is that these kids who live in the building and she wants to make friends with them, they're, they have ferrets and their ferrets toys are missing. Missing toy is not nearly as big a deal as an actual missing pet. But Hazel thinks if she can find the toys, she can get in good with these kids and maybe make some friends. And I think that's fine for the first scene, but that is actually like what's going on for the first five chapters before we get to the missing parrotlets. And and so it, it does feel very low stakes and it goes on for too long. And she kind of like teams up with this boy, Felix, who gets a POV chapter. And, um, and they're looking for these toys together, but it really needs to be them looking for the parrotlets together, like right from the start. So again, I just need to figure out how I'm going to, like, at what point, what thing is going to happen and which new resident slash suspect is going to be introduced and in whose POV is it going to be? <laughs> from the beginning. And that's just going to take a little time, but you know, another couple of days working on this and I think I'll have it. And then again, the rewrite will be fast. And like I said, the rest of my edits on this are very line level. Like some of the, um, world building was, they felt like a little too young for just the, the names I would give to places and things on this street that they live on, or maybe a little too young for this particular middle grade age level. That's, easy to change. They did have a really great uh, suggestion about having Hazel and Felix, they both have these issues they're working through emotionally separate from the mystery and they wanted to see Hazel and Felix like work these things out and talk them out together a little bit more and just like strengthen their friendship more throughout the book, which makes sense. So those are all things that I can do within the scenes that already exist. It doesn't take rewriting. That's an actual revision, right? Anyway, so that's where that stands. Now, the other thing I wanted to share with you guys in this video is that I got a really great email that's very relevant to what's going on right now that I wanted to share with you guys because this was a question for the Ask the Author shorts, but I think it's actually, it would be a little too long of an answer for me to do in a short, so I wanna answer it in this video. When it comes to middle grade books, I'm reading multiple guest articles and Twitter posts from librarians calling for shorter middle grade books with more accessible prose. With shortening attention spans and literacy lacking in some due to many factors, mainly the pandemic, are there any tips and tricks for penning shorter middle grade stories? So this is actually very much a trend right now. Um, I am part, as part of my job with this book packager, as I told you guys before, once a month we meet with our rights agents, like the, the agent team that sells subrights internationally, film and television and all that kind of thing, just to give us an update on here's, you know, what we're hearing from editors right now, here's what houses are looking for right now, and here's what they don't want. And and shorter middle grade books, like shorter word counts, is is a thing. Again, that's not to say across the board all middle grades should be short. People who are looking for particularly middle grade fantasy are not looking for 30,000 word novels. It's just, you know, so don't don't fret if that's what you're working on. But in general, they're just starting to, they're, they're wanting more um, books, middle grade books that are short and sweet. And honestly, a huge part of the reason, while I, I understand the literacy issue that this person is pointing out, and that's certainly something that we could discuss separately, I can tell you that it's actually a much more boring reason behind this. It's the printing crisis is still going on. Um, printing books is very slow, it's very costly, and obviously the longer a book, the more paper, the more expensive it's gonna be for the publisher, and the longer it's going to take and the longer they're gonna have to wait. And when I say this is still an issue, I mean like, I know someone who is a very successful author with a pretty dedicated readership who just had another book come out this summer and it was bumped twice just by like a month or two because of the printing issue. 
so it's it's and it that you know if you don't think that's going to affect your your you know pre-sales and launch sales <laughs> think again it very much is so publishers just want to you know avoid that as much as possible and also again it's just gonna be cheaper for them and have a much better chance of coming out on time if the book is shorter and i think that is a huge reason that this we're seeing this in middle grade in particular right now but also you know if we want to talk about literacy and everything um this is just pure speculation now i i i'm just basing this off of this is my opinion is what i'm saying nobody's told me this so take that take it all with a grain of salt uh, I, there is like a huge push for graphic novels right now for younger readers and I think I mean there's just you know manga is hugely popular graphic novels are hugely popular there have been certain breakout hits in young adult and middle grade right now like Heartstopper for example and publishers are seeing that and they're seeing those sales and they're saying yes please we would like more of this so I'm um, here's where my speculation comes in I think um maybe part of this is that you know graphic novels appeal to reluctant readers some readers just you know it helps to have pictures accompanying the story it helps it helps for a lot of reasons and so i think maybe when we're talking about shorter word counts and like i don't really want to use the word simplifying but this the person who emailed me said more accessible prose I think that's an appeal to reluctant readers and I I dislike when I hear authors or anyone speak about those books in any kind of negative way or like they're lesser because in my opinion it is even harder to write a book that appeals to a reluctant reader than it is to write a book that a dedicated voracious reader will fall in love with. I think that's a challenge and I think it's one that I hope a lot of middle grade authors in particular are willing to step up to and accept. And it's this all of this is relevant because these are things I thought about when I was developing this middle grade mystery. I like I, I told you guys this, I used to be a public school teacher. I I had a lot of this in mind as I was writing this book. There's a reason that Felix, this character, is drawing comics. <laughs> to illustrate the story. One of his struggles that he's going through throughout this book is he is having a problem um, with reading in, in his class and he's frustrated because he is a very smart kid, but he reading comprehension in particular is really difficult for him. And his father is a teacher at his school and keeps is like eager to help him, but isn't quite seeing the problem. And Felix is having a hard time explaining the problem. All he knows is that pictures help him. And so I wanted, to include a partial graphic novel format to illustrate this mystery to appeal to reluctant readers but I also wanted them to see themselves in Felix. On the flip side Hazel is like a voracious reader who especially loves mysteries obviously <laughs> and um, I, I just like that compare and contrast and so that's why he's got all of these kind of comic scenes and he's doing all of the illustrating and then she's got her little notebook as a detective where she's taking all all the detailed notes because that's how her mind works and they're both puzzling out the mystery they're just doing it in the way that works best for their brain <laughs> and anyway so long story short i i do definitely agree that there i know for a fact there is a call for shorter middle grade in general right now and while that is largely due to the printing crisis, I also think if you are up to the challenge of trying to write more accessible <laughs> prose, you will probably have a better chance of reaching a wider audience and appealing to kids who, you know, maybe think they don't like books. Uh, all I know is when I taught creative writing workshops, you know, this was like an after school weekend thing and my workshops were usually filled with kids who were obsessed with writing. They showed up super excited to write fiction, but there were always, every semester, there was at least one kid whose parents forced them to sign up and they hated writing and they hated reading and they hated books and they would say all of this on day one. And I loved that the most because it was a challenge to me. And by the end of that first workshop, every time that kid would walk out beaming because they wrote a short story that they loved and they were proud of and it's because i would let them break the rules that they learned in school and write the story and come up with it in their own way anyway that's a different soapbox so if we want to talk about 
tips and tricks for penning shorter middle grades. I think the biggest thing I can, the biggest tip I have, at least this is, this is how it was a challenge for me. I had just written this adult mystery. The plot was all over the place. I'm still trying to struggle through that rewrite, right? I tend to overcomplicate things. Um, I definitely tend to overcomplicate plots. And I very specifically wanted this middle grade to be short. I wanted between 30 and 40,000 words. And so the challenge there was like, okay, we need to make this a simple mystery, not an easy to solve mystery, not an obvious mystery, but a very simple mystery. And here's the mystery. The landlord's parrotlets are stolen and they're in his apartment when he locks the door to take a nap and they're gone when he wakes up and the door is still locked and there was nobody else in the apartment. It's a locked room mystery. How did the parrotlets just vanish into thin air? How did the thief get away with it? That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's the mystery. It is very simple, but it is not easy to figure out and it takes the kids they go down a few false paths before they realize and work out how it was actually, you know, how the, the thief actually got away with it and of course who the thief is. So I would challenge you first of all to come up with just the core of your plot and make that as simple as possible. And then, I know this isn't everybody's cup of tea, but I gotta say, outline it. If you wanna, the way I always hit my target word counts when I'm ghostwriting something, whether it's 30 or 50 or 80 or whatever thousand words, I have to outline it first. If I don't outline it, then how am I gonna know how long the book is gonna be? I have to know at around what word count I should be at the midpoint and around at what word count I should be at, you know, the kind of working up to the finale. I, I just, I really highly recommend outlining, again, if you wanna get yourself to write something nice and tight and concise for a middle grade audience. I really think this is something every author could benefit from trying. I had a friend text me the other day. She's reading a thriller, like an adult thriller, and she was like, I don't understand why all of these super established, great thriller authors just feel the need to explain and explain and explain again a concept in like four sentences that you could just sum up in one. She gave me an example, and this is not straight from the book, but it was like, she was afraid of the ghost, the ghost of the woman who had died. The woman was a ghost now, and ghosts are scary, so she was afraid. <laughs> and it cracked me up. But sometimes in adult novels, you read that kind of like, okay, I get it, you just took 50 words to tell me something that you literally could have told me in like seven or eight words. And I think writing for middle grade, it challenges you to be a lot more economical with your language, <laughs> your prose and your words. And just how how short and sweet can you be? Can you get to the point and still have a voice, you know? So that's that was really just one tip. If I come up with more, I will share them with you guys in a future video. But for now, I'm gonna get back to work on this revision and uh, that's it for this week. I hope you guys are having a good one and I'll see you soon with another Ask the Author short. If you have any questions for those, Leave them in the comments and I'll add them to my list. Otherwise, I'll see y'all next week with another video. Bye.